This is Soft Variable Bytes. Hello and welcome to another episode of Soft Variable Bytes. This is the show where I read to you articles and blog posts on subjects like software and cloud engineering and architecture, site reliability engineering, DevOps, and everything in between. Now, I have a long article, so I'll read the first half today and continue the rest in the next episode. Today's article is titled What Developer Self-Service Shouldn't Look Like by Casper von Grunberg of Humanitech.com What Developer Self-Service Shouldn't Look Like by Casper van Grunberg of Humanitech.com Developer self-service is a fundamental step every engineering team needs to take to reach true DevOps. True, you build it, you run it. Often, however, teams get self-service spectacularly wrong. This article will walk through some real examples and discuss how you should think about striking the right balance between golden case and golden paths. Developer self-service is the best thing that can happen to a team. You build it, you run it, is what you would want for your engineering team. It's setting the right incentives, unblocking developers, reducing cognitive lead. Developer self-service means striking the right balance between overwhelming people by letting them operate everything and restricting them by building abstractions. In fact, developer self-service is often used as an excuse for either shifting work left or for belittling developers. In this article, I want to explain how not to approach developer self-service which might be even more important than learning how to enable it in the first place. Shooting yourself in the foot. We're all bought in on the paradigm, you build it, you run it, right? I mean, this is literally what DevOps is all about. Heroically tearing down walls between operations and application development. We are all one now. Everybody does everything. Developer self-service is just a modern reincarnation of that motto. It's more 2021. It's confirmed as important by enough people with enough followers on Twitter and it leaves enough room to interpret it the way you want. In my opinion, it actually leaves room to be abused the way certain people want. Because both the you-build-it-you-run-it paradigm and the newer developer self-service are being abused by certain roles in the engineering team to avoid doing their job properly and instead waste time on nice-to-have stuff. While the early 2000s were dominated by application developers throwing unstructured code over the fence to operations and system administrators to somehow get it to run, We are now experiencing the opposite. Operations teams, or wrongly named DevOps teams, that come up with yet another cool technology and throw it at the application development team so they can self-serve it without proper training. Many also enjoy building abstractions that restrict the freedom of the individual developer. If your abstractions work in 90% of cases, but the remaining 10% are a pain, you don't win much. This is why it is insanely important to get the balance between the two right. It's important for the sanity of developers and equally important for managing the workload of the operations team building or not building abstractions. If ops don't do their job properly, All they are doing is creating more work for themselves and everyone else. 
because who do developers slack if they don't know how to debug those nasty helm charts, correct, operations, which in turn can go back and complain that they are missing their quarterly targets. It's a vicious cycle. You can clearly see this in the data. When we analyzed the steps of 1,856 engineering teams across the world, we asked what sentence would describe their DevOps setup best. Full, you build it, you run it, is by far not the majority. Coming in at 21.2%. 32.2% are running on old school, throw over the fence setup. Interesting is the remaining 44.6%. Those are the teams that basically tear down the walls, while at the same time overwhelming the majority of their developers with delivery tasks they aren't prepared for. Who fills in are senior developers that take over the de facto role of old school operations. There is little evidence this situation is better than the standard split between a sysadmin and a developer. There is nothing wrong with division of labor. The first thing to do here is to acknowledge that there is always some sort of division of labor. At enterprise scale, a no-ops world is a nice dream, but not much more than that. To quote my friend Aaron Erickson, who built Salesforce internal developer platform, service ownership is a good idea in theory, but in practice, people get confused. If developers have to run all the ops for their services, you do not have any economies of scale. To run 1,000 different services around Kubernetes, you shouldn't need 1,000 Kubernetes experts to do that. The question in reality is not about erasing the role of operations. It's about defining what the right handover point between ops and developer is. Rather than running on operations team, the way to go is running an internal platform team that focuses on lowering cognitive load through self-service. I will explain this using the cognitive load theory at the end of this article. Some truly bad examples. Enough of the high level. Let me give you two examples of setups that sound beautiful at first glance, but actually got the self-service balance totally wrong. They both highlight the arrogance of this new leave developers alone philosophy. The throw everything at them crew. This example stems from a conversation I've recently had with an SRE at a fast-scaling startup. Let's have a look at the setup this team built and what's wrong with it. The company was operating with customers from one continent, with no particular data production requirements. They were running four apps in production. Each application consisted of roughly 20 microservices, mostly written in Python for the back-end and React.js for the front-end. The company offered a B2B SaaS product. Loads were almost 100% predictable. Scalability wasn't a problem at all. They were able to set things up with no legacy, a luxury that no enterprise vendor usually has, from scratch. Let's say we strictly optimize for developer self-service and experience. What's the only thing this team should be using? The answer is a cheap advertisement for Heroku, not associated with them, and the link doesn't contain any kickback. Even this smart SRE couldn't give me a single reason why not to choose this. But Heroku is boring. It doesn't look smart. It doesn't make you feel a wizard or witch. It's not open source, and it's not recommended by the CNCF. In other words, if you are cool, you don't use Heroku. So the team went off and built the following beautiful setup. Kubernetes with EKS and a local provider because somebody in the business said this would drive sales in one geography. 
This local provider didn't offer managed Kubernetes, so they used a self-managed version. Four different DB types, some of them managed. Elastic, Redis, RabbitMQ, CI with Jenkins and GitHub Actions. Why would one standardize? Argo to sync the mess with the cluster. Then Terraform, of course, lets infrastructure as a code everything. Pour a snake on the top and throw it over the fence. Those things were all somewhat connected through scripts. No abstraction. Everybody does everything. If somebody asks, respond with you build it, you run it. Next, you might want to write a fancy article on Medium to describe your setup. And finish with a lot of super complex flow diagrams. I asked the SRE straight up. Do you think your developers feel comfortable operating your system? To which he responded, I cannot imagine they do. Have you asked them? No, that's the way we want it. So to summarize, rather than teaching teams one tool that is easy to maintain and operate, developers now have to operate Terraform, Helm Charts, Argo, Jenkins, Grafana, and Snake. And that's just scratching the surface. What was actually one? Nothing. And it's not that developers are dumb, of course. They could learn how to do all of this. Helm charts aren't rocket science. But what was one? The take it all from the crew. Hear that in the next episode. You just listened to part one of What Developer Self-Service Shouldn't Look Like by Kasper von Grunberg of Humanitech.com. Listen to the rest of it on the next episode. If you are looking for software and cloud development services and training, check out softwareable.com. We help customers in their software and cloud journey whether it's taking software from ideas to complete solutions, migrating existing systems to the cloud, or mentoring and training individuals and teams. We make it work for your needs. Go to softwareable.com, that's software without the E, I B L E, dot com, to learn more. Now let's check the tool of the day. Today's tool is Qlang, C-U-E. Q stands for Configure, Unify, Execute. It is an open source data validation language and inference engine with its roots in logic programming. Although the language is not a general purpose programming language, it has many applications such as data validation, data templating, configuration, querying, code generation, and even scripting. It comes with a rich set of APIs and tooling for defining, generating, and validating all kinds of data. Configuration, APIs, database schemas, code, you name it. Q can interact with various other standards like YAML, JSON, protocol buffers, open API, and integrates with Golang. Q also supports Kubernetes. And actually, dealing with configuring Kubernetes has been one of the sources of inspiration for Q and prompted its development. Kubernetes has no direct support for Q to validate the configuration. However, as Kubernetes is written in Go, Q can automatically extract definitions from its code base. One of Q's users is Istio. Istio uses Q to generate open IP. And that should do it for another episode of Softwareable Bytes. Have a great rest of your day, and I'll see you here again in the next episode.